Cheers and salutations. Welcome one and all to Americans Learn. And today's video is from Biographics. And it's going to be a controversial subject um, because I've heard of this character, uh, this person. Uh, I'm not too familiar with all the details of his story. I just remember seeing him in a film that was about the destruction of Nanking, uh, in which the Empire of Japan committed some very serious war crimes to that city and its people. And John Rab, I think I'm saying his name right, the title of this video is titled John Rab, the Good Nazi. <clears throat> you heard me say that right. So there's a lot to unpack there with that statement. Um, and look, every person throughout history, from current events to all the way to antiquity, we are all complicated individuals. So grab yourself a tasty snack and a tasty beverage, and let's learn more about this person, John Rabb, and find out about his story. And, well, I guess what he did, because, again, his actions in Nain King, because that's where he was at, um, were fundamentally important because as he as it may come as a shock i'm somewhat familiar he did save some lives he didn't save everyone but he did his part and i guess we all have to judge people the good and the bad so uh as always please be sure to support the original content creator the link is in the description box below and let's play this video in a three a two a one just before we jump into the video today, I do want to say that this guy is a German. His name is John Rab, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Germans. But I do want to say for all of the viewers today, I'm probably going to screw that up at some point. I'm probably just going to go with calling him John Rab because it's easier for me to pronounce rather than trying with the whole ra 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 thing for the whole video. So that's that out of the way. Let's get into it. What would you think of a man who supported the greatest mass murder machine in human history? A man who was proud to stand by a genocidal dictator who nearly destroyed Europe. A man proud to call himself a Nazi. Would you find him sickening or evil? Well, maybe not if he was John Raab. A high-ranking Nazi, Raab was an ardent supporter of Adolf Hitler, but he was also something else. He was perhaps the greatest humanitarian that you've never heard of. If God was making a script for a TV show and wanted to set up an un an unlikely hero. Ugh. This is this is one a hell of a terrible script. But it did happen. Known as the Good Nazi of Nanking, Rab was the Third Reich's man in China when the capital fell to Japan's German-aligned forces. Faced with the Imperial Army's genocidal actions, he did something wholly unexpected. He tried to save the lives of every Chinese civilian in the city. Over six incredible weeks, John Rab stood at the epicenter of a bloodbath, single-handedly protecting Nanking's residents from a whirlwind of rape and murder. He is today credited with saving 250,000 lives and he did all of this while still staying loyal to Adolf Hitler. Today, we delve into the fascinating story of history's good Nazi. A part of me feels sick in my stomach, but we must push forward. When John Rabb was born in Hamburg on November the 23rd, 1882, it was into a world that was on the cusp of a dramatic change. Just a year before, the rising state of Germany had delivered a surprise knockout blow to France in the Franco-Prussian War. For Rabb's contemporaries, that meant growing up at a time of unbridled optimism. Not that Rabb saw much of it, taken out of school at a young age when his ship captain father suddenly died and stuck into an unhappy apprenticeship, young John was a boy always hoping to escape Germany and see the world. And so he did. In 1903, the 21-year-old Rab set out for the Portuguese-African colony of Lurenquar Mark, now Maputo in Mozambique. 
It seems he planned to stay there long term, but an outbreak of malaria forced him to return to Hamburg after just three years. For John, this was a blessing in disguise. Back in Hamburg, he met up with an old school crush named Dora and was delighted to discover that she was into him too. The two courted, they fell Love before Tinder. Eh, it happened. Fell in love and became the sickening German version of those loved up couples who can't spend a single second apart. Yeah. If John had been a slightly more average man, well, that would have been it. But John, he wasn't average. Despite looking like a man cursed by a witch to forever resemble a certified accountant, <laughs> John Raab had an adventurous soul. Three years in Africa, it simply hadn't been enough for him. So, in 1908, he presented Dora with a plan. The two of them would move to Shanghai. Rather than ask if her new lover had gone mad, Dora replied with the early 20th century Germanic equivalent of hell yes. Neither of Okay, adventure. Fun times. Neither of them could have known they'd chosen to move to a kingdom on the verge of catastrophe. On November 15th, 1908, the Dowager Empress Sixi breathed her last in the Imperial Gardens of Beijing. The power behind the throne in China since 1865, her passing left the Qing Dynasty dangerously unstable. Already left reeling by the recent Boxer Rebellion, the family that had ruled China for over 250 years had now lost its matriarch. Sixi was replaced on the throne by her two-year-old Puyi, and spoiler alert here, don't bother memorizing that name. As the aftershocks of Sixi's death rumbled through Chinese society, John and Dora, they were entering a new era of their own. In 1909, the young couple married. In 1910, John got a position as a clerk in a seaman's office in Beijing. It was a position that would allow him to rise up quickly through the ranks, becoming a pillar of the German expat community. It was also a position that would give him a front row seat as China exploded. There's an old Chinese curse that goes, may you live in interesting times. Well, oh, I feel those words already. Hey, because we're living in interesting times, too. Hey, hey, hey. Well, times in China, they were certainly about to get interesting. On October the 10th, 1911, the city of Wuchang exploded in rebellion against the Emperor Boy. This lit the fuse on roughly a bazillion other powder kegs, and in no time at all, half of China was in revolt. Known as the Xinghai Revolution, it ended when six-year-old Puyi abdicated in January of 1912, ending the Qing Dynasty. For a revolution that closed the door on 2,000 years of imperial rule, the Xinghai Revolution, it went remarkably smoothly. China was declared a republic, and Yuan Shikai became its head. Like most other German expats, John and Dora Rabe were almost totally unaffected by the sudden changeover of power. However, the same could not be said for the next problem that was going to afflict China, and that, of course, was World War I. Okay, at this point, we probably need to backtrack a little for a quick historical explainer. For about 300 years before the Arabs had arrived, China had been the most powerful nation in the East. Then, in 1853, a guy called Commodore Perry led a fleet of ships into Edo Bay, just outside of Tokyo, and threatened to blast the city into rubble unless Japan opened up its economy. The result was the opening of Japan under the Meiji government. Good news for American trade, very bad news for China. This also, uh, side note, I actually had the opportunity to visit the Meiji Shrine, and it is a wonderful historical site. So if you ever go to Tokyo, once formerly known as Edo, please be sure to check it out. Uh, there's, there's a part of the shrine that I like the most because there's a whole area dedicated to the wine and then whiskey that, that uh, Emperor Meiji drank. So, hey, if you're, he's, he was a drinker. I, I like that. He, he liked fine wine and good whiskey. This new Japan, it quickly became a regional powerhouse. As China lumbered along in ossified twilight, Japan started throwing its weight around like a sumo wrestler receiving electroshock therapy. In 1895, Japan even whooped Beijing in the First Sino-Japanese War. This was an epic humiliation for China, and it got even more epic when Germany took advantage of China's weakness to occupy Qingdao in 1897, setting up the German Shandong. When World War I finally rolled around, China was 
eager to reclaim the stolen territory. Unfortunately, Tokyo, they weren't done humiliating them just yet. In late 1914, Japan and Britain joined forces to invade Shandong, kicking the Germans out. One of Tokyo's conditions for joining the fight was that China wouldn't be allowed to get involved. The Allies agreed. With China castrated as effectively as a eunuch, Japan gobbled up more territory, taking South Manchuria. In the war's aftermath, the Allies pressed China to officially cede Shandong and South Manchuria to Japan. Japan was further empowered, and China was further humiliated. Perhaps in response, 1919 saw China kick out its German expats, including John and Dora Raab. Oh, wow. Despite having lived in China for more than a decade, suddenly they were personas non grata. The death of President Yuan Shikai back in 1916 had, by 1919, triggered a collapse of Chinese society known as the Warlord Era, with China balkanizing into competing states constantly at war with one another. The cities desperately needed foreign expertise to stop themselves from imploding. Before 1919 was even out, John and Dora Rab had been begrudgingly invited back in. Oh, jeez, this already looks terrible. Ah, uh, this re reading it. The Nazi of Nanking. I mean, really? The warlord era it came to a close in 1928 when nationalist troops led by Chiang Kai-shek succeeded in reunifying China by force. They established a new capital in Nanking, beginning something called the Nanking Decade. It was a time of prosperity that China had not seen since before World War I. The economy it boomed, stability reigned, and people's lives improved. Among them was John Raab. Throughout the warlord era, this quiet German businessman had plugged away with typical Central European efficiency, rising through the ranks of Siemens Asian Division, even as China crumbled all around him. In the boom times of the Nanking decade, Siemens made Raab managing director of its Chinese division. Delighted John and Dora, they moved to Nanking in 1931. But 1931 was also the year that the wheels started to come off the new era. On September the 18th, Japanese forces used the pretext of a terrorist attack in South Manchuria to invade Manchuria proper, setting up a pro-Japanese puppet state under our old friend, Emperor Puyi. Rather than fight this new aggression, the Chinese did something that probably seemed smart at the time, but in retrospect does look a bit stupid. They took their case to the League of Nations. <laughs> Set up in the way... <laughs> I shouldn't be laughing at that, but it was like, I ain't gonna solve nothing. Even I know the League of Nations could do jack. <laughs> Why would you? <laughs> oh, man, that's... It seemed reasonable, but, you know, it, 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 was, it was very, very stupid of World War I, the League of Nations was meant to settle disputes between nations without the need for war. In practice, though, it was pretty weak and toothless. When it concluded the Japanese had been wrong to invade Manchuria, the Tokyo delegation stormed off. Rather than cool tensions, the League had actually raised them. But things, they wouldn't explode just yet. Back in Nanking, John Rab was becoming the most important Westerner in all of China. In 1934, he opened a German school on his property and made himself the chairman. This brought him into contact, for the first time, with the Nazi party. That same year, Adolf Hitler had become Germany's unchallenged dictator, and yes, the emphasis on the first syllable there was fully intentional. In this dark new world, as it should be, being a public German figure meant being a Nazi even if you lived in China. But this wasn't a problem for Rob. He already loved Nazism. Historians struggle to reconcile the humanitarian John Raab with the fascist John Raab. Although he joined the party late in 1934, Raab quickly became one of Hitler's biggest cheerleaders. He wrote of the regime, I believe not only in the correctness of our political system, but as an organizer of the party, I am behind the system 100%. Remember, this is a man who had many Chinese friends, who considered China his home, and here he was throwing his support behind a system that considered the Chinese inferior. The world is cursed. Those old Japanese samurai movies had a point. And if you ever watch it, occasionally there will be dialogue of violence and how the world is cursed. You'll, 
Yeah, the world is cursed. The world has to be cursed. There's, there's, there's no other explana- explanation to it. The best guess historians have is that Rabe, as an expat 5,000 miles away from home, was unaware of National Socialism's racism. At the same time, he was enthused by the socialism part, with its emphasis on protecting the dignity of the working man. Whatever the truth, Raab soon rose up the ranks of the party and became the leading Nazi in Nanking. It was a rise that would coincide with one of the worst atrocities in modern history. On July the 7th, 1937, a skirmish broke out on the Marco Polo Bridge between Chinese and Japanese forces. It was just one of many such clashes that happened following the occupation of Manchuria, but this time something went wrong. The clash progressed into a battle, and the battle progressed into a Japanese invasion, and the invasion, well, that progressed into a war. That's right, the Second Sino-Japanese War, it had just begun, and it would make the first one look like a bit of a stroll in the park. Right from the off, the Imperial Army steamrolled across China. In no time at all, they were converging upon Nanking. As bombers rained fiery death down on the city, all of those with money, they fled. Among them were John and Dora Rab, who joined a tide of Westerners streaming away for the relative safety of places like Pitaiho. But John and Dora, they were never ones to lay low and avoid danger. On September the 21st, they returned to Nanking. As John would later write in his diary, he didn't just return to protect his property, but because he felt he had a duty to his Chinese employees. And here's where we get to the really difficult part. Raab didn't return to help Nanking in spite of being a Nazi. He did it because he was a Nazi. As hard as it might be for us to stomach, it was the ideology of Nazism that made Raab feel that he had to stay, protecting his Chinese workers as the Fuhrer was protecting Germany's working men. By October, barely 20 Westerners remained in the city. As the Imperial Army closed in, Raab called the other expats to his house, and 14 responded, among them American doctor Robert O. Wilson. We have to do something, Raab told them. That something was the Nanking safety zone. Raab's plan was simple. Despite being completely unarmed, the 14 Westerners would unilaterally establish a two and a half square mile zone of neutrality in Nanking, centered on Raab's house and the German school. Surrounded by white flags, it would protect as many Chinese civilians as necessary. When word got to the advancing Imperial Army, it dispatched Major Ocker to try and talk this crazy German out of staying. As Rob later recalled, Ocker came to him in person and asked, Why in the devil did you stay? Why do you want to involve yourself in our military affairs? What does all of this matter to you? You haven't lost anything here. Looking the Major in the eye, John Rab replied, I have been living here in China for over 30 years. My kids and grandchildren were born here, and I am happy and successful here. If I had spent 30 years in Japan and were treated just as well by the Japanese people, you can be assured that in a time of emergency, such as the situation China faces now, I would not leave the side of the people in Japan. The loyalty in Rob's statement, it seemed to touch something in the Major's soul. Oka agreed Rob could stay in the zone and that no harm would come to him. Unfortunately, he said nothing about what would happen to any Chinese man that Rob tried to shelter. As fall gave way to a bitter winter, Rob, Wilson, and others plastered Nanking in posters telling citizens about the zone. Rob even personally sent a telegram to Hitler asking him to request the Japanese acknowledge the zone's neutrality. You can probably guess how that one went. No. During the last few days before Nanking fell, Rob dramatically draped buildings in the zone with vast Nazi flags, hoping to deter Japanese bombers. He had swastikas painted on walls, decked his car out in party regalia, and took to wearing his not. Okay, look, I'll continue on with the rest of the video, but probably the only time, the one time in history where that symbol actually might have done some. Ugh, ugh, I'm not even gonna say it. Ugh. Like, hey, don't, don't, don't shoot here. Of all the times, all the people, I. Ah, uh, some good, I don't know. Oh, this is really a difficult thing to sit through. Not a uniform in public. At the last moment, Nanking's mayor officially handed power over to Rob and fled the city. Now all Rob and the rest of his expats could do was wait. 
On December the 11th, heavy shelling had started. As the bombardment increased, the last Chinese in the capital flooded into the zone. A quarter of a million people converged on Rab's property, sleeping in ditches, cramming themselves into tents, climbing across one another just to be let in. It was a wave of human desperation unlike anything the Westerners had ever seen. Two nights later, Rab stood at a window with Dora, watching the columns of flames to the south. In his garden below, a crawling mass of humanity wailed and screamed and begged for their lives. As the screaming and the shelling grew louder, Rob finally snapped. Donning a metal helmet, he strode into the garden and screamed at the refugees to shut up. He said that it was all going to be fine. The Japanese would treat them fairly. He was absolutely sure of it. But his words, they were lost in the din of the gunfire. If they had carried, it's unlikely anyone would have heeded them. It was December the 13th, 1937, and apocalypse was in the air. As the flames roared high, the refugees huddled tight together. Whatever happens next, they knew that it would not be fine. On the morning of December the 14th, John Raab awoke to a city blanketed in eerie calm. Donning his uniform, he ventured out into the cold, empty streets beyond the zone, wondering what he would find out there. The roads of Nanking were littered with corpses. Hundreds of civilians lay lifeless in the streets, shot in the back as they fled. Bodies of women had been mutilated, their vaginas penetrated by bayonet blades. On a street corner, Raab found a small contingent of Japanese troops looting a German cafe. When he tried to stop them, they laughed. Although they didn't harm Raab, they burned the cafe down, amused by his impotence. As he returned from this unsettling expedition, Rab passed a bedraggled bunch of 400 Chinese army regulars trying to retreat. They were exhausted, stumbling, cut off from safety. The sight of them was so pitiful that Rab told the soldiers that they could take refuge in the zone on the one condition that they disarmed. He still felt certain the Imperial Army would respect the zone's neutrality. No. That night, diplomat Katsuo Okazaki called on Rab, who was still acting as the mayor of the city. He informed the German that they'd received intelligence that soldiers were in the zone. He told Rab they'd have to be arrested, but he assured him that no harm would come to them. Unable to do anything else, Rab agreed. Over the next few days, Japanese fighters marched through the zone looking for Chinese soldiers. Their method for detection was to look for calluses on their hands from firing rifles. To Rab's horror, thousands of young men were dragged from the zone, the vast majority of them rickshaw drivers and workers who'd been wrongly identified. They were lined up just outside and machine-gunned, their bodies being dumped into ponds. It was John Rab's first encounter with the brutality of the Imperial Army, and it would not be his last. As the tense December days passed, rumors began to drift into the zone of atrocities being committed outside of it. There were reports of Japanese soldiers going from house to house looking for women to rape. Age, it was not an issue. There were reports of abused girls who were so young that the soldiers slit open their genitals so that they could fit inside them. Boys were forced at gunpoint to rape their own mothers, men to rape their own daughters. Women who'd been abused were sexually tortured to death, their genitals mutilated. In the zone, John Rob listened to these reports with a mounting horror. Again and again, he petitioned the Japanese officers who did nothing. He telegrammed Germany and demanded help, but nothing came. Just before Christmas of 1937, something in him it seems to have snapped. Cut off from the rest of the world, in a city that had gone mad, Rab came to an inescapable conclusion. If he wanted these atrocities to stop, he would have to do something to stop them himself. And this begins the inspiring chapter of John Raab's life, the moment when he did something so mad, so courageous, he can only be called a hero. With Nanking burning around him, Raab, dressed in his Nazi regalia, left the relative safety of the zone. Completely unarmed, he set out to save the city's residents. This was nothing short of insanity. Rob might have been protected by the Imperial Army's officers, but it was a very loose protection. Out on the streets, he was just a man and a man without a gun who was staring down the bayonets of Japanese soldiers. And yet, that is what he did. Day after day, as the sun crawled up into the winter sky, Rob would leave the zone, listening to cries of help for the telltale screams. He would follow these shrieks until he found the marauding soldiers, storm right up to them, shove his swastika armband in their faces, and give them a brutal dressing down. Amazingly, it worked. Terrified by this German barking orders at them, the soldiers, they fled. Rab would then take the girl they'd been abusing, walk her to his car, and instruct the driver 
to take her to the zone. Then he'd simply carry on walking, looking for the next woman in trouble. And then the next, and the next. Now, it's really impossible to overstate just how crazy this was. Rob could have been killed hundreds of times, yet there was something about his authority, something about the way he wielded his Nazi party membership that put the fear of God into the Imperial Army. Elsewhere, the Nazi swastika became a symbol of hate. In Rob's hands, it became a symbol of hope. Words that you think would never be associated with that symbol. Yet Raab was not just some silent angel passing through the hell of Nanking. He was a man capable of understanding the need for warmth for humanity. He and Dora organized birthday parties for children in the zone, singing songs as death and demons clawed at the doors. Unsurprisingly, most of the boys born in the zone that winter, they were named John. Rob also managed to win over his fellow Westerners. Dr. Wilson was a staunch anti-Nazi who considered anyone who joined the party evil, yet even he grew to respect this one Nazi, even if he could never understand how Rob could be so good while supporting something that was so evil. Six weeks after the Zone's first refugees arrived, the end it finally came. In the dying, bitterly cold days of January, the Imperial Army's High Command reasserted control over their forces in Nanking. They marched into the zone and removed the refugees. A collaborator government was set up and the rapes were stopped. In a cruel irony, the Imperial Army triumphantly proclaimed that they'd restored order to the city. Today it's estimated that a minimum of 20,000 women were raped during the fall of Nanking. The widely accepted death toll it ranges from 100,000 to 300,000. Prisoners of war were decapitated with swords, they were blown up with landmines, they were doused in petrol and set on fire. In Japan, many still deny that the rape of Nanking ever happened. Less than a month after the zone was dismantled, Rav got a call from Siemens ordering him home to Germany. Packing as many films and photos of the massacre as he could, he promised Wilson he'd spread word of the rape of Nanking back in Europe. Then he boarded a plane with Dora and he left. And that was it for John Rubb. As soon as he touched down in Germany, he was arrested by the Gestapo for annoying their Japanese allies. He was imprisoned, and it was only the intervention of Siemens' CEO that saved him. Reassigned to a lowly clerical position, Rubb spent the next few years struggling just to make ends meet. When World War II ended in mid-1945, his former standing within the Nazi party saw him arrested again, this time by the Allies. Put on trial, Rob was only saved this time around by testimony from Dr. Wilson. Left to rot in jail for a year, Rob was finally declared denazified in 1946, and he was released. With a stain of Nazi membership clinging to his soul, the last years of John Rab's life saw him become unemployable. As the post-war German economic miracle saw living standards rise in the defeated nation, John and Dora Rab sank into helpless poverty. The only thing that kept them going in those harsh years were semi-regular food parcels covered in Chinese writing. Their return address, it was always Nanking. Finally, in January of 1950, John Rubb keeled over and died of a stroke. He was 68. By the time he died, Rubb was a nobody. A source of shame back home in Germany had been written out of the Chinese history of Nanking by the newly installed Communist Party. Those who'd been in Nanking, they remembered him, but the rest of the world they forgot. In the 1990s, Iris Chang was researching the Nanjing Massacre. She uncovered Rab's diaries alongside stacks of documents relating to his involvement in the safety zone. Piecing his incredible story together, she managed to return his name to the world at large. Not long after, the Chinese government paid to have Rab's gravestone taken from Berlin and reinterred in Nanjing, the modern city that John and Dora had known as Nanking. It was placed at the site of a gigantic memorial to the massacre. After half a century, Rab had finally been returned to the country which he'd fought for and had loved so much. Nowadays, it is estimated that Rab's actions in Nanking saved somewhere in the region of 250,000 lives, nearly everyone who made it into the zone. By contrast, the far more famous Oscar Schindler saved 1,200 people. There is no doubt that Schindler was a hero, but Rob, he was something more. He was a savior. As history's good Nazi once wrote, if you can do some good, why hesitate? 
So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up below and don't forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos just like this several times a week. So hit that subscribe button and you'll find out all about those. And if you're looking for something else to watch, why not click on one of the videos on the screen now? And as always, thank you for watching. All right, a lot to unpack there with said video. Um... Obviously, John Rabb did, did do the unthinkable and the heroic. And I think if we look at people and their actions, we must judge them for what they have done, both the good and the bad. But John Rabb must not be forgotten. And while he was associated with the most vile, hateful, tyrannical political and government at the time, he was not that government. He was just a member of it. But his actions as an individual and as a man still resonates to this day because those 250,000 people that he did save, well, they had families. And those families had families. So because of him, they're still around. And that's something pretty historic. And there was a point to where the world almost forgot who he was. So while it's easy to vilify him for what he was associated with, his actions on the other side of the world saved people's lives. I, I know, and how do I know of him? Because I've seen a film, um, I think it had to deal with it was all it was in black and white and its name is escaping me now but it was associated with uh Nanking and um it was all in black and white uh and i remember seeing <laughs> i remember seeing the nazi flag there i'm like well, wait a minute what what is that what is that doing here and like anybody who's curious i forget damn, this is so many years ago now I opened up a book, you know, looking up the history, decided to do some research, and I found out who John Rabb is. I didn't, it didn't go into full details about his past or, you know, where he was born, but it's good to know that he is somewhat being acknowledged. And what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts of this person? Are there more videos of unsung heroes that we don't know about? People who are somewhat questionable but did do good? I know that's very questionable to say, but we shouldn't judge everyone. And I think it's up to all of us to make our own decisions. So type in the comment section below your thoughts about John Rabb and what he did. The world is complicated, but hey, we can all do what we can to build a better future. So let's all try and do that. Until then, take good care of yourselves. Peace. And all the best to you.